Who's? Uh, We're still here, Salma. I know, but I, I clicked the chat, which maybe I shouldn't have, and now how do I get back? Uh-oh. We should still be there. If you're on a PC, you should be able to click on the blue Zoom button at the bottom of your toolbar. Oh my God, how did I do this? This is why I should never, um, I'm on a PC. So do you see the blue? Oh, okay, okay, I got that. Okay, perfect. Okay. Oh God, I get so nervous. No worries. <laughs> <clears throat> So for those who have done the webinar trainings with us in the past, you know that we really kind of just dive right in and do virtual demos of everything. Doing demos of Zoom is a little bit funky because while we can share our screen in, in Zoom, and that's going to be something we, we show you guys today, Zoom doesn't actually let you show the Zoom window, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so it's a little bit more PowerPoint heavy today, just with screenshots. There will be some demoing that we do. As a reminder, this is the Zoom basics, we call it, kind of an introduction to utilizing Zoom for teaching needs. So while there's some topics that we will, uh, that we will bring up, for example, say the breakout rooms function, it's more so just to let you, let you know that it is there for you to utilize. We won't go in depth demoing all of these different features, but you're more than welcome to come to one of the drop-in sessions or one of the other trainings that we're offering throughout the summer. So with um, that, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay. And are you guys able to see PowerPoint full screen or are you seeing the slide presenter? Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so like I said, my name is John Glevy and just a friendly reminder, while Crayley and I always try to get back to everybody as quick as we can. Any types of issues that you run into, whether you're utilizing Zoom or Canvas throughout the day, the most, the quickest and most efficient way to get any type of support is to go through the help desk. Quayle and I do pull from the help desk tickets, but there's actually also another team that helps assist us with that as well. So kind of a shameless plug just to remind everybody. So the topics that we're going to be diving in today, what is Zoom as an overview? I know everybody's here, so you figured out at least how to open up Zoom, but we'll talk a little bit about what, how it can be utilized for your teaching, as well as discuss the Canvas integrations and how do you go about the logistics of starting, hosting a meeting, and then using it as a teaching tool. And then of course, we also like to go over some security recommendations that we have for everybody for a seamless experience, as well as just some kind of tips and tricks that we've uh, come across being that we've been on Zoom working with everybody for the past three months or, or, or a little bit more, I guess now. So high level, what is Zoom, right? So for those <clears throat> who are familiar with tools like Skype, Google Meet, and WebEx, I'm sure you figured out it is very similar to that. It is, it is Rider's official web conferencing system. It is available to all Rider students, faculty, and staff. Rider University has a pro level license of Zoom which enables everybody to have up to 300 simultaneous participants in a Zoom meeting, be able to integrate it within Canvas, as well as be able to record to the cloud. While Rider Zoom does allow you to have up to 300 participants, that's not necessarily something that we recommend doing for your own sanity. And then of course, one of the really nice features of Zoom compared to previous systems Rider's had is there are full mobile application supports for both iOS and Android, so Apple, Apple and Android. Some of the reasons we do really like, and I'm not going to uh, touch on all of them, but for those who have utilized maybe Big Blue Button in the past, that was uh, the conferencing platform that was integrated with Canvas. What's really nice about Zoom is the, the technology behind what that's powering Zoom is a lot more robust. So you're going to notice a lot higher audio and quality video, excuse me, a lot higher quality video and audio with Zoom compared to others. And one of the things that I personally really like is the screen sharing and the annotation tools within Zoom. And obviously right now you're seeing the screen share. What's nice about Zoom is it lets you select either just a particular window or an entire desktop. And then of course the ability to record and share meetings right into the cloud and be able to share those recordings with students. So for those who have never actually created a Zoom meeting before, at least created one with the Rider University license, one of the first things we're going to want to make sure that you do is claim your Zoom license through Rider. 
And the only thing that you have to do for that is to go to the rider.zoom.us website. That is Rider's like that is Rider's hosting URL. At which point you'll see this little screenshot. Followed by pound. You'll see this little screenshot. At the bottom, you can go ahead and click on sign in. And then it'll bring you to what should be a familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, a familiar login page to utilize for your rider key credentials. Uh, in other words, it's just your, your username Otherwise, and password. Uh, excuse me, your Canvas username and password. You are in the meeting now. There are 18 participants in the meeting. Once you log into Zoom, and this will be something that we demo for you in a minute, you can, this will be the screen that you see at any point, you can go ahead and click on that blue schedule a new meeting button, and then it'll pull you right into there. Uh, Quayle, I'm getting feedback. From, okay, thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. And I just realized I was muted too when Quayley did that. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. We were getting feedback. If you, it, I don't know if you heard it on your end, we were getting a lot of feedback on our end. So oh, let me start the screen share back up again. So like I started to demo and at this point, I actually don't remember when I cut out. But one of the things we can demo is claiming your account and doing, getting ready for, to set up that first meeting. So to claim your account, you're going to go to the website rider.zoom.us. At which point you'll be able to click on that third red sign in button. It will ask you to log in with your rider key. These are the same credentials that you use to log into Canvas for those who get confused between the rider key and Gmail. And at this point, this is the screen that you'll see. There's no, nothing else you have to do to claim your Rider Zoom account. And then once you're ready to start scheduling your first meeting, all you have to do is click on the blue schedule a new meeting button. Before we dive into that, some other areas that I just wanna point out. On the left-hand side, if you were to click on the profile tab, you can change some of your personal preferences. You can also at this, if you wanted to upload a picture when you upload a picture into Zoom, if you ever were to turn your video off, like I just did right now, you can see that it wouldn't just show your name, or it would show whatever, whichever profile picture that you uploaded. <laughs> and as you scroll down, you can see that there's some more personal and per personal preferences you can change, as well as do things like integrate it with your, say, Google Calendar. So if you're using, utilizing Google Calendar a lot through Rider, or even if you're using a personal Outlook or Exchange, you can actually sync everything up. So that way, when you're going into a Zoom meeting, it makes it a little bit easier to add those, that add that information. On this left-hand navigation pane is where you can also see your previous meetings in these four tabs, as well as set something called a personal meeting room. And this is really useful for if you ever want to do office hours. And this is something that we would be happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one in some of the drop-in sessions. Going back to this left-hand side navigation pane, we can also see your previous cloud recordings and be able to share them out from here using the share button for particular meetings. And then we also have some area where we can change additional settings. This time it's not really about your profile, so like say your name and email address. These are individual settings you can change of how Zoom acts when you're hosting a meeting. Rider does go ahead and change some of those settings for you in advance based off of best practices, but there are some that you can go ahead and tweak yourself if you ever wanted to. Any questions on any of that um, through the chat that <clears throat> for me to go back before we start going over scheduling a meeting, Quayle, are we good? Just demo um, the recurring part when you're setting up a meeting because there okay. was a question about that. Sure. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into scheduling a meeting. I'm going to dive back into the PowerPoint really briefly, just because there's, it's a little bit easier to show you. So when you go into the schedule a new meeting button, we're going to have these two screenshots kind of on one page. And I'll go back to that in a second to show the reoccurring meeting. 
The reason I wanted to pull up this slide is you can see there's a lot of different settings that we have that we can change. However, only the ones that are delineated with a number is something that you should really mess with. And the, only, and the ones in red are the ones that are actually required fields in a meeting. And I know it can seem a little bit overwhelming when you're going in and you say, oh, there's so many choices, like I don't wanna break anything. So all you actually have to set is your meeting topic, or in other words, the name of the meeting. Description is optional and actually does not show up for the participants. And then the date and time. And what's interesting about Zoom meetings is the date and time is actually only for scheduling purposes. And what I mean by that is at any point in time, you can go ahead and reuse the same Zoom link, even though the date might have been a day off or something like that. Like I said, we're going to go back in a second. I'll show you how to utilize the reoccurring settings, but this is where you can check off for reoccurring meetings. Meeting password by default. You will have a meeting password assigned to your account, and that is what Rider RIT does recommend, so you can go ahead and keep that. And then as we scroll down a little bit further, we have meeting options. And the three I'd like to point out to you are the mute participants on entry, enable waiting room, and record the meeting automatically. So mute participants on entry, that is what it sounds like. This is especially useful if you have maybe a bigger class, like 30 to 50 students or, or participants. When anybody comes in, we actually saw that a minute ago when there, somebody came in with a lot of feedback who's still trying to dial in. What's really helpful is you can actually have all of your users muted when they're coming in. That way it gives them a second to realize, one, they're actually in the meeting now. Uh, and two, it alleviates a lot of the you know, when everybody's getting settled, maybe they're moving their laptop around, there's papers, it can get really loud very quickly, especially as you start to get up to like those 15 plus individuals in a meeting. So that's really helpful. Enable waiting room is another great functionality if you have not utilized that already. What the enable waiting room does is essentially create a virtual holding space for participants. And this is actually something we had turned on for today's meeting that you experienced. Before the user actually can get into your meeting, you have to allow them to come in. And what's nice about that is if somebody's maybe in the beginning of a meeting, you want to get a couple of minutes set up for before when you have your get your PowerPoint, whatever lecture notes that you want to have, but you want to make sure that you're in there and ready to go, you can have the students stay in that waiting room until you allow them in. And what's also very nice about the waiting room, it's not like a physical waiting space where individuals can interact with each other. Nobody can participate in the waiting room and nobody can see who else is in the waiting room, only the host and the co-host. And then finally record the meeting automatically. As you saw today, when we were trying to record this meeting, it's very easy to forget that you want to record a meeting. And so what I tend to do is when I remember that is go ahead and just check off that record the meeting automatically button, at which point you would be given two options record in the cloud or on your computer. And we always like to stick recording everything right to the cloud. So let's talk about scheduling a recurring meeting and demo that. So I'm going to go ahead and you guys can, uh, we're back to seeing Zoom's website, right guys? Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and click on this blue schedule a new meeting button. And let's use the example for office hours for a class. So we'll call it AJ's office hours. And instead of it being on the 29th at 11 a.m., I'm going to go ahead and check off this reoccurring meeting checkbox. And I don't need to be daily. I'm going to go ahead and change it to weekly, at which point I have all of these checkboxes for different days of the week. So say I want it to be Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'll check off Tuesday and Thursday. And let's go ahead and do it at 3.30 p.m. Like I had mentioned, the duration is purely for scheduling purposes only with Rider's pro account of Zoom. You are not limited to those 40 minute or 45 minute uh, limits like you might've seen if you ever tried to set up a, a non-Rider Zoom meeting in the past, or maybe you're using another colleague's Zoom account at a different institution, they were limited. You have no limits on your Zoom meeting lengths. That does not mean we advocate having three hour meetings. <laughs> Finally, the end date, you have two options. 
next to these little radio buttons, you can choose to end it on a particular date. So say I just want to be running these office hours through summer two. So I'll have it run through the 21st. Or I could have changed it to be after five occurrences, no longer. But I'll go ahead and keep it just on that particular date. So I'll scroll down. Like I said, I want to go ahead and enable that waiting room for this meeting just because I want to be able to limit which students are coming into the meeting at a given time. If I'm talking about something, maybe a, a student's personal grade, I don't want other individuals just to kind of appear out of nowhere. So that enabling the waiting room will let me actually select who gets into the Zoom session at what particular time. And if I wanted to, I could go ahead and record the meeting automatically. And like I said, you're going to get these two little boxes show up on the local computer and in the cloud. And we really encourage all users to record everything in the cloud. That way, it's much simpler to go ahead and share after the fact. And just so you know as well, if you were to say record something on the local computer just because you didn't want to use it in the cloud but then had an issue, there's really only so much that Quailer I could ever do to, to support you guys because at that point, it's on your personal computer or even your router computer. There's no way for us to know where these recordings are being saved. That's something that you would have to discuss with OIT. So like I said, it's a little bit easier to just go ahead and stick within the cloud. But since these are my office hours, I don't actually really want them to be recorded. So I'll go ahead and just uncheck that. Alternative host at the bottom is not something generally you will have to utilize, but it is something I at least like to cover just in case that ever is applicable. Alternative host means that say you were either co-teaching, team teaching, or maybe you're just running a meeting with another colleague and you might not be able to get there on time, but you also didn't want to limit the ability for your colleague to go ahead and get things started and also control the meeting settings. If you were to click on alternative host and add an individual here, they, that user would automatically be the host if you are not in that meeting. And they will also automatically, if you are in that meeting, they'll automatically get the co-host properties. So that way they could help you manage the meeting settings. So I'll go ahead and click on save. At which point we now have our meeting created. There's a couple of different ways that I could go about notifying students of this. One of kind of the easiest ways, if we're not doing it through the Canvas integration, is to just send the Zoom link in a an Canvas announcement. And what I can do for that is on the right hand side, and I apologize, the floating heads right now might be in your way, but on right to the right of my cursor over here, we have this button that says copy invitation. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that, at which point we'll see all of my meeting dates and times have already been populated right within this invitation, as well as the joining URL with the password already put in the URL. So I'll go ahead and click on copy meeting invitation, at which point I can see I get a green confirmation box saying copy to clipboard. And then I could just go ahead and paste it into either Canvas announcement, maybe I'm just emailing my class, so on and so forth. And that is how you set a reoccurring meeting. Like I said, while we did do reoccurring, the steps are exactly the same for if you were scheduling just a regular meeting. And at any point in time at the bottom of the page, I could click on the edit this meeting button and edit any of the settings that I wish to change. I'm going to dive back into the PowerPoint. Are you guys seeing PowerPoint again? Perfect. And talk about, oh, and we just went through this. And talk about another way we can go about utilizing Zoom in the classroom. And that is actually doing the integration right within Canvas. With Riders Pro license, this is something that we installed right into the Riders Canvas. So that way you don't even have to go to the Zoom website if you don't want to. It is automatically in all of your Canvas courses. You just have to go ahead and enable it. So to do that, we'll go into your Canvas settings at the bottom of the page, at which point you'll see all of your regular Canvas settings. But I'm going to go ahead this time and click on the navigation tab in, in the top. And that's the screenshot on the right. And you're probably used to seeing this if you ever tried to rearrange or maybe hide some of the links. At the bottom of your, uh, excuse me, at the bottom of this list, 
usually at the bottom, sometimes the second to bottom, you will see zoom and it will be disabled by default. If you were to click on those three dots, number three, and then click on enable, and then of course save at the bottom, you will be able to pull up the integration right within Canvas. And what that looks like is what we see here. So I'm still in Canvas and on the left-hand side, I have Zoom now in that left-hand side navigation pane. And as a very similar screen to what we just saw in the web version, we can go ahead and schedule a new meeting right within our Canvas courses. The only difference within, <clears throat> excuse me, between having an online versus within Canvas is if we set everything within Canvas, students will also be able to see all of the upcoming Zoom sessions right within their same Canvas course. They will also be able to access all of the cloud recordings right from the cloud recordings tab within Canvas. Normally, this is something I'll also demo within Canvas, but we are doing some testing right now with other stuff in Canvas, so I can't actually show it. So we're just looking at the screenshot. I do apologize, but any questions jumping out with the Canvas integration with Zoom? And like I said, just please remember to utilize the chat and then Quayle will flag them for me. So like I said, there's really nothing truly different between scheduling a meeting online versus on Canvas. The same meeting settings are available when you're establishing that meeting. So you can do things like set it as a reoccurring meeting, give it a topic as well as a date and time. Again, duration is really irrelevant in this case. External participants still can join a meeting. So say if you ever wanted to have a guest speaker, but you did the meeting invite right within Canvas, that doesn't just limit everything to your Canvas students. You can still go ahead and share that URL with anybody else, either over email or wherever it is. And then by the fall semester, we anticipate there's actually gonna be an update coming to the Zoom to the Zoom LTI within Canvas. There's nothing that you have to do, don't worry. But if you are setting those reoccurring meetings, I think somebody had asked about that before. If you're setting the reoccurring meetings within Canvas, students will actually be able to see it on their calendar, their, excuse me, their Canvas calendar as well. So that can be a super helpful feature. All right, at this point, I wanna pivot a little bit and talk about, okay, so we, we established our meeting, we created it, we shared that link, but what do we actually do when we start that Canvas session? Excuse me, that Zoom session. You can tell it's a Monday. Um, <clears throat> at the bottom of your Zoom pane, and just like how everybody had here when they first joined on the meeting, you're gonna have a few different buttons. When you are the host or the co-host, you will have a few more buttons to choose from. So I'm just gonna kind of go over those very quickly. Everybody today still has the mute and unmute, excuse me, the mute and unmute button, which is that number one that does just what it sounds like, turns your microphone on and off, as well as start and stop video. Number three is a newer button that just got added in this past, uh, past about month and a half or so within Zoom, and that is the security button. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but that is really nice because Zoom put all of the security settings right within easy access. So these are things like enable the waiting room, be able to remove a participant, <clears throat> as well as the, uh, the ability to lock a meeting so nobody else can come in. Participants button will pull up the participants pane. That will be able to show you everybody who is in your current meeting, as well as be able to mute individuals right from that participants pane when you are the host or the co-host. Finally, of course, we have chat after that, which many of you I see have been using for the Q&As. The one button that is a different color other than the end session button is the share screen. And we're gonna go into a lot more detail in a second about that. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm sharing my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation up on my screen right now. As well as the polling function, the record button, and the breakout rooms. At any given time, you might have some of these buttons not showing. That might just be because the screen isn't that big on your computer or maybe you have Zoom minimized a bit. So if you were to click on 11, the more button, you'll be able to pull up these any of these other settings as well. <clears throat> Going back to those mute and unmute button as well, start and stop video, you'll notice there's actually a little carrot pointing up next to those buttons. And what's really nice about Zoom compared to other platforms, say like um, WebEx, 
is you are able to do very quick switches of your microphone, speakers, and video cameras by clicking on any of those little carrots up. So for anybody who's maybe using an external webcam or maybe that they have a docking station at their office desk and it's just not working quite right, people can't hear you, maybe sound far away or it's pulling the wrong camera, we don't have to go into any crazy settings. At any point, we could actually just click on that little carrot and you can see here is a great example. Instead of my integrated FaceTime camera, I wanna use this external webcam. So I can tell whatever is enabled by the little check mark here. Same thing with microphone and speakers. If you maybe have a, uh, an external monitor that has an integrated speaker, but you're hearing it out of your laptop still, by clicking on the little carrot next to the microphone button, we can change your speakers as well. Going back to all of our settings, like I said, I wanna dot, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna dive into a little bit more about the sharing screen functionality as this is obviously one of the most important ones that we'll have to talk about when you're using Zoom to teach. So if I go ahead and click on that share screen button, I'm gonna get a pop-up in a second. And what that pop-up is going to allow me to do is share my desktop or just a window or a program. The difference between those two items is if I was to share my desktop, anything that I have up on my physical screen the participants will see. This can be very helpful if you're doing like what I'm doing now and switching back and forth between say online and a PowerPoint or maybe Microsoft Excel and your, and your slide lecture. But sometimes I just wanna be able to share one particular item and, don't, and not have users see everything else behind. So maybe I'll only share a Microsoft Word document or a PDF. We can also pull up a whiteboard function within, right within Zoom. One of the other options that you can also do within Zoom, and I know this has been a little bit more popular with the science folks, is you can actually tether your phone, especially an iPhone works really well with Zoom, and to be able to pull up a mobile application and have all of the participants see that mobile app. And the reason I say that this has been popular with the science is because I know some of the applications that they actually use in the lab are only on iPads, so they can still demonstrate to students what that looks like. You can also actually do this thing called optimize your screen share for a video. And what that allows you to do is you could, in theory, be able to play, say, a YouTube video at the same time for all students. And they would also be able to hear the audio from that session as well. So like I had said, after we clicked on that green share screen button, we're going to get this little pop up. And if you notice, these are all corresponding to what I just spoke about. So we have desktop share. Number five here is just the PowerPoint or just with the particular, you can see Snag, it's another application I hadn't opened on my computer. I could just choose to open this up. We also have the ability to open up the whiteboard within Zoom if you had wanted to do any types of annotations. And then six and seven at the bottom here, like I had mentioned, you can actually share your computer sound with the participants. So say if I was trying to, and I know this is very popular with faculty in the in Westminster uh, College of the Arts or the Choir College, you can share a recording that is on your computer and have all of the participants be able to hear it in high quality audio. And then number seven, optimize for screen for full screen video clip. That's like if I'd wanted to play a YouTube video for everybody, by checking off six and seven, it makes it so it's pretty decent to be able to still kind of have that experience where you're being able to play a video clip for students in the class and maybe break up your lecture. John, yes. can you demo the whiteboard in a second? Yes. And I, I also have a question about how can they show um, Google Jamboard? Okay, we're going to learn Google Jamboard together, it sounds like that. <laughs> um, I am going to go back uh, right, right after this next slide, I am going to demo the whiteboard for you guys. And like I said, I apologize. This isn't this is one of the things we can't actually demo in real time because this little pop-up that you see here on the PowerPoint is only actually going to show to you as the meeting host. Zoom is does a really good job in hiding all of the behind the scenes. So like right now, when I'm pulling up the participants pane or when I'm pulling up the chat, you're not actually seeing any of that. Zoom is hiding those windows. That way it's a much more streamlined experience for the participants but it just makes doing Zoom trainings online very difficult sometimes. <laughs> One last thing I would like to go over in that bottom toolbar before we dive into the whiteboard is the recording function. 
And so like I mentioned before, we can choose to record our meeting automatically at the beginning or at a point in time. So if I just wanted to go ahead and start recording my meeting, say halfway through, I could click on that record button, at which point I can, I have my two options again, record on this computer. And then of course the one that we want to go ahead and select re record to the cloud. And the second screenshot here is what the button is going to change to when you're in a recording. At any point in time, you could pause the recording or go ahead and just stop it entirely. I'm going to go ahead and do a new share now and pull up the whiteboard. Are you guys seeing a white screen? Okay, silence is bliss then because I can't actually see Quelly nodding. So. There are controls that I have up here where I can change from something like a drawing. Whoop, excuse me, hang on. I'm going to close my PowerPoint first. Let's try that again. Okay. Where I can do just kind of those text drawings, excuse me, those freehand drawings. I can also do things like draw straight lines pretty easily but not perfect because I'm using my mouse and I'm not the greatest at that. There's also the ability just to erase particular things as well as be able to change colors of something that you're drawing and be able to still type text. The one thing you cannot do with these is the ability to carry whiteboard sessions from one class to the next. You can save them. And like I said, there's a little toolbar that pops up that you don't see right now, but I as the host see. And you can save anything that you put on here, but you cannot carry them over to different sessions, if that makes sense. Now, if you give me two seconds, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up Jamboard. And normally when I utilize Jamboard, I'll have it on my iPad just because I have a stylus with my iPad and it's a little bit easier, but you can still go ahead and do that. So let me go ahead and pull up Jamboard. And it's a Monday, so my internet's apparently slow. And I can see Quayle went ahead and since I'm collaborating her, with her on this, changed my smiley face to a frowny face because that's our sense of humor is when we get to Friday afternoons. So I can still go ahead and, but just by sharing my screen, anybody, anything that I put on the screen and any drawings that I do is showing up on the board as well. And then if anybody was in the Jamboard session with me, they could go ahead and draw on that as well. If you have absolutely no idea what Jamboard is, you've never heard of it, don't know what I'm talking about, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about it right now. It's more of a collaborative whiteboard environment that you can do with students. If you would like to learn a little bit more about that, please feel free to come to some of the drop, any of the drop-in sessions, and we'd be happy to work with you. All right, let me dive back into the Canvas slide deck. Uh, one more thing, can you just show how to play a video? Yes. Just give me two seconds, guys, to pull something up. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. And this time I'm doing that optimized screen share for video and sharing computer sound. And then whenever I'm ready, I can go ahead and start playing the video and you should be able to hear the computer audio. Tour of my live streaming setup. Camera, you could use a webcam. In my case, we're actually not using a webcam. We are using 
And this is where it's over the top. A Canon so, C200. Like I so it's said, basically a, you, the one thing is you do so have to have pretty decent internet camera at home to be able to use this without it pixelating for all the for students. The reason but I it at least it gets the job done where there are times that you definitely want to be able to share a very quick video or maybe an audio clip with students and be able to have everybody watch it at the same time and then discuss afterwards. And Zoom does allow you to do this pretty well. Any other topics to go over before we dive into the security recommendations, Grayley? We're doing good on time, guys. So please feel free to utilize the Q&A function at the bottom. Okay, let's dive back into the PowerPoint. All right, so let's just talk about what we just covered. So we did how to claim our account. We learned how to schedule a meeting both outside of Canvas as well as inside Canvas and how to enable Zoom within your Canvas course. The one thing I don't think I mentioned, um, just to go back to Canvas really quick, that is on a per course basis when you turn that integration on. So if you're say teaching two sections of the same course, you have to go ahead and enable it in both of those sections. You also have to do this each semester unless you copy your course. And then when we went over kind of the basics of how do you actually host a meeting and do the most important functionality like sharing your screen. One of the last things I'd like to dive into is security recommendations that we have as well as a couple of easy ways that you can manage security within your Zoom session. So I'm sure everybody on the call here heard the phrase Zoom bombing at some point. That was Quayle and I's favorite word when we all started going to remote and alternative instruction this spring. Zoom did respond, and for those who don't know, there's actually been a lot of changes on the back, and that really does not occur anymore. However, Zoom, it did expose some flaws that Zoom needed to make it easier for the meeting host, like yourselves, to be able to control the meeting settings within an actual session. So like I had mentioned, Zoom added this little security button. And at any point in time, you can click on that security button and be able to change meeting settings on the fly. For example, you can allow and disallow participants to be able to share their screen, be able to chat amongst users, and be able to rename themselves. So if there was ever a time that you did not want students to be able to share the screen, or maybe you have that turned on off by default, and you want somebody else to be able to share their screen, by clicking on the security button, and then the ch whether or not this little check is next to each setting delineates whether or not it's allowed, you can check that on and off. You can also enable and disable the waiting room on the fly. So say you're okay with everybody jumping in in the beginning of the meeting, but then once you go ahead and start your session, you only want to be able to allow specific users in to make sure that it's either it is who they say they are or you don't want a disruption when somebody else is coming in. You can go ahead and just do that on the fly. And the final meeting setting is this thing called lock meeting, which is a newer functionality of Zoom. What lock meeting does is once you were to turn that on, no other users, regardless of whether or not they're in your class or not, can get into a meeting. So this is something we really want to use sparingly and only kind of use in those almost emergency situations when something might have happened, you want to make sure that nobody else can get in. I will tell you personally, I've never once used this lock meeting functionality in my life. Um, and Quayle and I have plugged a few hundred, uh, have clocked a few hundred Zoom meetings at this point. A couple of other topics we just want to kind of go over quickly with you guys, since, like I said, all of us teaching remotely kind of live on Zoom was new for all of us. But some of the tips and tricks we've come across in supporting all the faculty this past spring, it's great to go ahead and personalize your profile picture. Uh, this personal meeting ID, like I talked about, if you were interested in doing office hours where you just wanted to have the same link across all of your courses, we could go ahead and set up your personal meeting ID, which is super easy to do. And we would be happy to work with you after this session on doing that in one of the drop-in sessions. Zoom allows you to either join within the online, excuse me, join within your browser or download the little Zoom desktop client or desktop application. We personally like to recommend using this desktop application just because it works a little bit better. It's not as resource intensive, resource intensive on your computer. So what I mean by this is if you wanted, if for whatever reason you really just wanted to utilize Zoom within your mobile browser, like in Chrome, 
it could suck the battery out of your laptop a little bit quicker. As always, we want to test your speakers and microphone before any big sessions that you're running just to make sure that it's working well. And use, don't be afraid to use the mute button to reduce audio distractions, whether that be for yourself as a participant in a meeting, or if you're hosting a meeting and for whatever reason there's a lot of feedback or a lot of other activity going on, you can mute an individual at any point in time. <clears throat> Finally, a couple of last things, obviously monitor Zoom chat. I know that's difficult, especially if you're the host, like I had mentioned today, but students will tend to put questions to you in the chat. And that's a great way where if students maybe are a little bit too shy to all of a sudden speak up in a virtual meeting, they will utilize the chat. And that gives you a great way to be able to kind of give, get a pulse check of everybody in the session. And any documents that you plan on being shared, so things like your PowerPoint, if you want to pull up any PDF files, or like I said, maybe an Excel file, if you're demonstrating some of those, pull them up before you start your Zoom meeting. That way it's a little bit more of a seamless experience for all of those participants. Okay, that covers most of the topics that we, <clears throat> that we ever cover and then some within this session. Finally, like I mentioned, the most important thing, go ahead and claim your Rider Zoom account if you have not done so already at rider.zoom.us. And also don't forget that there are mobile applications available. So if you, for whatever reason, if, um, if you like to utilize your, your tablet for Zoom meetings or kind of my personal preferences, be able to have those redundancies set up where say my power goes out, like it actually has done a few times this past couple of weeks, or my internet all of a sudden decides to conk out on me, I can still get back into my session very quick on my phone while I get everything else back up and running. Quayle, any other questions that people had to go back and go over? You're muted. I said, I think I got everybody. Perfect. Well, great guys. We try to keep this session a little bit shorter just because of the Q&A. And since this is, while this is the basics, we do cover a lot of ground. And so I hope that you got something out of it. If there's anything, like I said, some of those more advanced sessions, some of those more advanced topics, like breakout, fun breakout rooms functionality, as well as the polling, we don't cover that in the basics just because that is a whole thing in itself, but we're happy to show you during the drop-in sessions or some of the other, I believe next Wednesday, um, I'm not sure if that registration is filled up yet. We have the engaging students using Zoom. We cover those topics in a lot more detail. But at this point, um, I know everybody was muted because of we were getting feedback and we couldn't know where it's coming from. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any kind of lasting questions for the group. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point.